I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Jay Hess is the Carl Weller Professor and Chair in the Department of Pathology here at the University of Michigan. is also the Director of the Division of Pathology Research. He received a Bachelor's in Biophysics from Johns Hopkins and an MD and PhD in Biochemistry, Cellular and Molecular Biology, also from the Johns Hopkins University. After completing residency training in anatomic pathology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital of Harvard, he completed fellowships in hematopathology and surgical pathology, also at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and then at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He's board certified in anatomic pathology and hematopathology and has completed graduate coursework in business administration and healthcare management at the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, and at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. He served as an assistant professor of pathology and co-director of the hematopathology training program at Washington University School of Medicine and as an assistant attending pathologist at the Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, where he focused on the molecular biology of leukemia. He joined the faculty of the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania Health System as an associate professor and was promoted to the rank of professor there in 2004. While at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Hess served as the director of hematopathology and co-director of the hematologic malignancies program. The focus of his research has been on the epigenetics of cancer, particularly in the development of more effective therapeutics for acute leukemia. Dr. Hess joined the faculty of the Department of Pathology at the University of Michigan in July of 2005 as a professor and chair. Dr. Hess. Well, thank you for the introduction. Maybe a little loud, thanks. Um, it's a, a real pleasure for me to be able to um, share a, uh, my perspective with you um, on cancer therapy. I think it's still echoing a little bit. If we can. Um, so, what I'm going to be talking about today is actually, in some ways, putting the cart ahead of the horse in the sense that some of the most um, successful applications of personalized medicine have been in cancer therapy. So, a lot, of, I think, of where dentistry will be will probably be more in the earlier part, the early detection of cancer and so forth. Most of what I'll be talking about today is actually uh, patients who've already developed cancer, but then how do you optimize their therapy? Uh, to give you a, a bit of an overview, though, I do want to talk a little bit about the biology of cancer and just how big a problem uh, cancer diagnostics is, and then um, actually go in a kind of a different direction. And if personalized medicine is to be successful, we have to find an economic model where it's going to work. It has to catch on or, or we're not going to be successful. And then I'll tell you a little bit about um, just a fraction of what's going on in personalized medicine here at the University of Michigan in cancer. It's probably no surprise to any of you that cancer is a major public health problem. 1.6 million new cases are diagnosed each year and over half a million cancer deaths and of course, that's just in the United States. So if you think at a global level, this is one of the major killers of man. And um, if you think about, for example, in, in a dental practice screening for what kinds of cancers would be out there and all, uh, the, major, the major killers of, of, of men are, are uh, lung cancer and prostate cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, and um, leukemia, hepatocellular carcinoma, and all. But you can see it's actually, um, there's a relatively small number of major cancers out there, which of course would be things that you would, you would really like to have a strategy for picking up earlier. Oh, just one other thing. Um, you know, it is interesting to see what, what interventions can do. And of course, uh, reducing the rate of smoking has had a big impact on lung cancer deaths, as has uh, 
screening for prostate cancer and screening you know, colonoscopy for colorectal cancer. And a lot of this isn't um, better drugs, it's just catching disease earlier. So among women, of course, this, the story is, in some ways is quite sad that uh, you know, during the 1960s um, was a time when women began smoking more and, and, and we're starting to see um, you know, this, it's beginning to plateau now, but a dramatic rise in the incidence of lung cancer. The other thing I, I, I can't help but um, uh, point out is, you know, if you look at pathology textbooks from the early 1900s, lung cancer was considered a rare disease, you know, and so very much an environmental problem. Breast cancer, encouragingly, is going down, and again, it's not the therapy, it's the earlier detection, and then colorectal cancer, a pretty significant drop. So, uh, I'm a hematopathologist, and, and this has been um, a good area to be in if you're interested in personalized medicine, because it's where some of the biggest successes have been realized. And uh, one example would be chronic myelogenous leukemia, which is uh, basically a myeloid leukemia of, of fairly differentiated cells of, that gives you an elevated white count in the peripheral blood. And of course, this was the first uh, type of cancer in which um, a chromosomal translocation was associated with it that fused the BCR gene to the ABL kinase. And there are all kinds of technologies for detecting it. This is a fish signal showing a fusion of the BCR and ABL. But in some ways, we were very lucky with CML because every patient with CML has the BCR able translocation. And as we'll see with other kinds of cancers, it's often not that clear cut. But this gets us into the, uh, uh, the area of biomarkers and just how important they are. And, you know, for example, in, if you're going to be looking for biomarkers in saliva or, you know, whatever, what's, what's the uh, importance of this? So they're molecular cellular indicators of a biologic state. Um, the most useful ones in cancer, as you can imagine, are those that are only found if you have cancer and, and are not in normal tissue. So uh, CML has been a very interesting paradigm for us because as the field has evolved, um, you can do polymerase chain reaction or PCR to detect the BCR able transcript. You can do you know, carry a type or whatever, but you cannot, really, you, you cannot uh, diagnose a patient with CML unless you do this molecular study. It's diagnostic. But it doesn't stop there. You actually um, treat patients um, based on the quantitative level of their transcript. So not only could there be the possibility of diagnosis as you start thinking about personalized medicine, but monitoring. Think of all the kinds of therapeutic monitoring that might be done, for example, in a, in a dentist's office. Um, the ABL kinase is a therapeutic target, as we'll talk about, and a, fortunately, a very, um, the very effective drugs have been developed for it. And um, as, as I'll show you, that it, it's really quite sophisticated. We actually sequence the ABL gene to figure out which drug to put patients on. So um, cancer made the cover of time. Uh, when, when CML came along and uh, Gleevec or imatinib was an early kinase inhibitor, it bound to the ATP kinase domain. And it's a, it's a pill, a, you know, a, a generally, um, you know, once a day pill that seems to put people in long-term, often molecular remission, dramatically prolongs their lifespan. This is a, you know, this is really a cause for celebration. Uh, mutations have been identified in the kinase domain that make drug, makes this uh, CML become drug resistant, but fortunately there are a variety of other drugs that have been developed. So you can see this creates another opportunity if you're in pathology to do more predictive testing. So, you know, you, you sequence this ABL kinase and you can say this is the drug that you're going to need to put the patient on. We'll talk a little bit more about the the relatively high cost for targeted therapies, and so there's a lot of value for molecular diagnostic testing. This is just showing um, this idea of um, when you treat patients with CML, they'll become resistant. 
but um, it is uh, now standard practice. We have a molecular diagnostics lab full of ABI 7700 sequencers all lined up to sequence these different types of um, oncogenes for, for different diseases. So uh, in a way, I don't want to say we got lucky, but CML was very simple molecularly compared to most of the tumors that are the ones that those are more common uh, killers of men and women. Uh, the most common types of cancers are solid tumors, not hematologic malignancies. And um, uh, these cancers like lung and colon cancer, breast and prostate cancer are much more complex. And in, until recently, the causes of these have been largely a black box. Uh, you just don't know what's going on. They don't have those simple chromosomal translocations. And of course, that makes rational therapy difficult. Uh, most of the drugs, I, I really, I, I'm actually rather embarrassed to say our most effective drugs for acute leukemia are drugs that were developed more than 30 years ago. We're still using the same drugs. They're very nonspecific. They target things like DNA replication. They kill rapidly dividing cells, things like that. Um, when patients don't respond, it's, for the most part, we still have no idea why they don't. And there are many toxicities, um, many side effects. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the problems of things like secondary malignancies or growth retardation or lowered IQ in, in patients that have had radiation or chemotherapy. So um, what's really been changing all this is actually the advent of new technologies and high throughput sequencing. And I know you'll see this similar slide at least one more time today, but Really, um, if you follow uh, Moore's law, you know, for, um, what is it, CPU speed or memory? I think it's memory. Um, the, the rate of increase of, uh, or, or the, the, the cost of sequences is dropping much faster even than Moore's law. When, when these new types of sequencers came along, the first um, human genome, the human genome project, uh, you know, around 2000, it easily cost $100 million to sequence a, a genome, and now the, the instrument costs are like $1,000. So there's been an absolutely phenomenal reduction in the cost. And you have to assume that this is just going to continue until getting your genome sequenced, you know, is, 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 is like a, getting a chest x ray or something. We have to imagine what is the world going to look like when you have that kind of uh, information available. So, um, you know, William Osler, if it were not for the great variability among individuals, medicine might be a science, not an art. And it, you know, if you think about that a little bit, um, we put a lot of value on the expert diagnostician and, you know, you do your examination and kind of integrate all this data and all. But at least in cancer, a lot of it's about the molecular profile. And, um, you know, when, when you get to that level of information, that's really precision medicine. That's going to be driving therapy in the future. So here's a, uh, this next slide is going to be kind of scary. So this is a prostate cancer. Um, uh, this, th these um, are chromosomal translocations that occur in prostate cancer. And virtually all of them were discovered here in, in, in uh, Dr. Rural Chenayan's lab. And the, the point of this slide is just to point out that cancer is complicated. And CML, unfortunately, was the exception, not the rule. So if you're trying to figure out what's going on in prostate cancer, you're going to have to sequence it to figure it out because there are just too many possible molecular abnormalities. And they have different therapies in all in the future. So this is a very, very common theme. It looks like most kinds of cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, uh, they have a few percent of them have this translocation and a few percent have these mutations. It's a very, very complicated picture. And even so, there are some amazing successes that are coming along. So one of them uh, is in metastatic melanoma. And, um, and there are these BRAF inhibitors that are actually quite potent. And um, so uh, you detect the uh, mutations in BRAF, and then um, these patients, as you can see, this is actually um, 
This is a patient with widely metastatic melanoma, lots of nodules in the lung, in the lung and it, it is just, this melts away on this drug, and it's not something that you see with conventional chemotherapy. Another one was um, in lung cancer. Um, interestingly, a kinase that was known to be rearranged in large cell lymphomas, the L kinase, was also rearranged in about 5% of lung cancer. And for those of you, you know, being the common disease it is, as you know, the median survival for metastatic lung cancer is like six months. You know, it's a very, it's a, it's a uniformly fatal disease. It's not a disease that you're used to seeing dramatic improvements in. Uh, but in this particular patient from this New England Journal of Medicine article, you can see very extensive lung cancer melt away with a once a day oral drug. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. So that's the promise of personalized medicine. Can you imagine if there were a pill for each type of lung cancer that you could take one, you don't even need an IV, you know, you just take it, your cancer melts away. We don't need cancer centers anymore. You can have like outpatient clinics. That's the dream, right? So um, I'm gonna spend a fair bit of time though talking about the economics of all of this because we can't ignore that. And I, I think one of the th helpful ways of looking at this is just to try to put yourself in the position of the different stakeholders, patients, providers, payers, pharmaceutical companies and molecular diagnostics companies. So we all know what it's like to be a patient. Um, I want the best molecular diagnostics. I don't care what it costs. I want the best drugs. I don't care what it costs. My insurance will pay for it if I have insurance. Um, but the, even there, there are problems. So insurance in general pays for infusional chemotherapy. And I know the Accountable Care Act, which is currently uh, being uh, heard before the Supreme Court, is the constitutionality. But basically, at the moment, there's still a donut hole that people are, are, are working to address. But basically, these are very expensive expensive drugs, as we'll see, like chrysotinib is almost $10,000 a month, and if, you know, you, you don't have very good insurance, you may still not be able to have the benefit of it. And, and another thing that I think um, it applies to all of us in healthcare is to begin to think, you know, patients are pretty sophisticated con consumers. You know, they'll come to your office and say, well, do you do, you know, whatever, do you do, do this kind of molecular testing? If not, you know, they'll, they'll go somewhere else. You can't fall behind in this. Providers, I mean, we all want the best for our patients. And I don't want this to sound cynical, but in the world of oncology, oncologists primarily make their living infusing chemotherapy. So to think about that a little bit, um, they don't get paid for referring patients elsewhere. They'd, they want to be able to treat those patients. And a couple of examples um, of areas that have been problematic, Bexar, which was developed here, which is an I131 radio-labeled, uh, it's an NICD20 monoclonal antibody, is, a, I think, a good case study because it actually is very effective. The problem is the oncologist does not administer the drug. They send them over to, you know, nuclear medicine or whatever. So there's no one... Unfortunately, there's no incentive to use that drug, and there are other things that they can infuse in their office. So it's something to think about. The other is, um, you know, at a place like the University of Michigan, sure, we have a lot of clinical trials and all, uh, but, you know, most of the people who provide care in the U.S. are in community hospitals, and they just assume try to do it in their own hospital if, if they could. Um, so providers, uh, personalized medicine sounds great, but there's a lot of questions. First of all, these are very busy people. They don't have a lot of time to read about how good or bad things are, but how good is the evidence that it works? Where do I send this uh, uh, for testing? And, and um, can I even get the test done? Am I gonna get paid for my time for doing this? Who's gonna pay for the testing? But on the other hand, if I offer the best diagnostic services, more people may be coming to me because I'm, I'm up to speed with, with the latest and best. So pharmaceutical companies, a very different perspective, um, and, and unfortunately, as we know, um, when you're a multi-billion dollar organization, 
you know, you have to, you have to focus on things that are going to be blockbuster drugs. You, you, need, you need to have um, drugs that are going to be widely used. And, and so it's hard to get pharmaceutical companies' attention for more specific kinds of therapies uh, like this. Um, of course, as we all know, they, they make money on drugs under patent protection, and, but it can have a long um, developmental lag time before they can market it. So there's a relatively short window of, I will use the economic term mon monopoly, where they'll basically charge as much as they possibly can, and then the drug becomes generic and the profit drops almost to zero on the drug. Uh, and so um, this actually drives personalized medicine because if you have um, the ability to um, get FDA approval sooner because you have a good molecular diagnostic test and so forth, um, you, you can actually um, reap financial benefits and also get a, a, a drug out that will benefit more people. I, I'm, I'm just digressing for a moment to illustrate um, because I know I'm talking a little bit about economics. Some of the problems we're running into, I don't know how many of you are familiar, there's a huge problem with generic drugs right now. Um, there's, a, there's over 100, there's about 180 different effective generic drugs that are in under supply right now, including a variety of widely used cancer chemotherapies because of, frankly there just isn't enough margin for them. And that's, a, that's an example of a real market failure that's harming patient care. So, um, you know, pharmaceutical companies do spend a lot on advertising and other things, but there's no question that if you look at a major drug, the typical costs associated with developing it are, you know, a billion dollars. And, and, and several hundred million of that are conducting very large clinical trials. They're very expensive. So they could definitely save money if, 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 if you could um, predict which patients are going to respond more effectively, you could, you could run trials with a lot fewer patients and that would save a great deal of money. Um, essentially develop a companion diagnostic and find the patients who would benefit. Um, so um, the other interesting aspect of this is if you, let's say the ALK translocation in lung cancer, if only 5% of the patients benefit, um, you can see you could run a clinical trial where you only run it for the patients who would benefit or you could run it on all lung cancer patients and you see you'd probably throw the drug out because you'd say it didn't work but in fact it actually worked great it was just you, you have to give it to the right patients. Uh, just a little bit on because um, I noticed some of the students questions were um, somewhat related to this is you know what are the areas where this kind of companion diagnostics are likely to be most valuable. And this is actually a study done by McKenzie, so it's a consulting firm. Um, but you can see here, uh, it's a little hard to see, but um, this is the scientific potential to develop a companion diagnostic. And it's a little bit hard to know what they mean by that, but the pace of discovery, are there specific genetic abnormalities or whatnot? And then this is the economic attractiveness of developing a companion diagnostic. And at least in this study, um, the two that are really outliers are oncology and basically different kinds of anti-infective in, infective drugs. And it kind of makes sense. I mean, if, if, if you're giving a drug for a microorganism or a virus and it, this is not effective, it it's, it's, it's puts a lot more value on predicting who's going to be likely to respond. And the same thing in cancer. Um, some of the things that we're maybe talking about um, later in terms of predictive um, medicine and all are actually kind of on the low end of the value scale and I think probably during the discussion we'll have a little time to talk about that. There are a lot of companion diagnostics and routine use right now. Um, these are some of them uh, the, for uh, lung cancer, EGFR mutations, BRAF mutations, um, HER2 new amplification in breast cancer, see kit for these gastrointestinal stromal tumors and CML. So, you know, one of the questions people, uh, some of the people it raises are, when's personalized medicine coming and everything? We're, I mean, essentially we're doing molecular testing and putting people on specific drugs now. So in a limited way, we're, we're, we're doing it and have been doing it for at least five years. So uh, just a little bit more about pharmaceutical companies. Um, they, they 
basically, they, you don't go anywhere without getting FDA approval, but then, you know, if you can get FDA approval for any specific indication, there, there are ways of, you know, broadening the use of the uh, drugs for other diseases. Um, in terms of cost, um, I, I mentioned earlier, crizotinib, about $9,600 a month. Um, uh, imatinib is about $40,000 a year. Um, treating these uh, GIST tumors over $60,000 a year. So if you're concerned about the cost of diagnostic testing, and we need to be concerned about cost, but if it gets people on the right therapies and all, it may still save money. So it's, or at least improve health at a, an acceptable um, improvement in quality of life. Uh, just a couple other things. The more specific the drug, the more limited the application. That's not surprising. We've had a lot of trouble getting any, anyone to work on pediatric tumors, for example. You know, the market's small. And, and also this idea of companion diagnostics. Um, one thing that's interesting, I, I alluded to this earlier, is that um, what we're seeing is that the same molecular abnormalities are being shared by a variety of kinds of tumors, and that creates an interesting opportunity to use uh, a drug that, um, that, you know, for example, the ALK, uh, uh, the drugs that work against the ALK kinase that were originally developed for anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Um, it, well, it turns out there are neuroblastomas that have the same uh, uh, translocations or mutations and, and non-small cell lung cancer. So I think we're going to see a lot more um, uh, drugs that work against a variety of tumors, and it'll have this secondary effect of a lot of people be interested in finding those tumors somehow, you know, so that they, they can, I mean, the pharmaceutical companies would love for you to go out and find these patients who have these abnormalities. It, it really broadens their market. Payers, of course, we have, we have major uh, challenges in controlling costs in healthcare. I mean, the federal government pays for about half of all healthcare, uh, $2.6 trillion, um, I mean, in aggregate and healthcare expenditures. So at the same time, we want to do all these neat things and all, um, do more molecular testing. There's tremendous pressure to do just the opposite and, and do less testing and control t uh, costs and all. Uh, I just uh, just want to touch on the concept of cost effectiveness analysis, which is um, not done very much right now. If, if there's a, uh, a drug that's available for cancer patients that seems to improve survival, the insurers have pretty much been paying for it. Um, but some of the yields are pretty low. For example, uh, uh, crizotinib at $9,600 a month probably cost more than $150,000 per quality adjusted life here. And most people in the U.S. consider perhaps $50,000 to be cost effective, and if it's over that, it isn't. So we're spending quite a bit on some um, uh, pretty expensive drugs. So payers are worried, are, is testing going to drive up costs? You want to do testing in your dentist's office? Great, who's going to pay for it? You know, we have to have that conversation. How much benefit? How many people are you going to pick up? Uh, potential savings from, okay, so this is a big one. Um, in the United States, the average person has their, gets their insurance uh, from one company for about six years, and then they change to a different insurer. So that we're a very mobile country, we're changing plans and all. So, very big um, testing costs for predictive medicine or something aren't very popular with payers because that could be for diseases that are going to be way down the road when they're on Medicare. They're not saving that private insurer money. They're, they're, they're saving somebody else money. Unfortunately, that's uh, something that, that they're thinking about. Will the providers pr follow protocols? You know, you can do all this expensive molecular testing and somehow you didn't dose the drug right or you put people on the wrong drug or something. It's very complicated and these are very busy people. And then the reliability and potential misuse of information. I, and I noticed that um, one of the other talks talks a little bit about 23andMe. I don't know, I'm just curious, has anyone ever sent their DNA to 23andMe? Or, Oh, okay, so Dr. Gianobli, how about, 
how about the, uh, if you've read The Language of Life by uh, Francis Collins, he did, you know, at the beginning of the book, he starts off by saying, I sent my DNA off to 23andMe, it was amazing. It's, this is funded in part by Google and all. This is like a, you know, pretty big time company in terms of its financial backing. Well, they mixed up 96 samples and, um, and they reported the results out. And you might say, no big deal, it's just for curiosity, but they actually tell you about paternity and things like that. And there were a lot of problems because people, you know, really had reason to doubt their parents were really their parents and things. The other is there, um, there are some pretty bad um, things happening. Um, not, what, any new technology that you apply or in, in scientific research, uh, you know, you, they're, they're, they're problems. And at Duke University, one researcher there, Anil Potty, really fabricated a lot of data and um, patients were treated based on some of the data from these trials. Now the patients are suing Duke University and all. And so I'd say it's a young science and um, there are risks. You know, we may misuse the information or something. Uh, just picking up the pace here a little bit, uh, molecular diagnostics companies, we, we run um, a reference lab, M-Labs, I'll tell you briefly about. Um, this is a rapidly growing industry, as you can imagine. Um, they're for-profit labs or academic labs like ours. And uh, basically, one of the challenges is that it's fairly easy to get paid for therapies. It's fairly difficult to get paid for new diagnostic tests. Even in a very expensive drug, it's often, it's kind of ironic, but the pharmaceutical, the, um, the payers will pay 10,000 a month for the drug, but they won't pay the $500 for the molecular test. And there's a lot of, you know, another thing to consider, will they pay for the molecular testing? How do we make the case it's worthwhile? And there's a lot going on in the regulatory environment, even to the questions about whether or not genes are patentable, the very prominent case Prometheus versus Mayo and Myriad Genetics and all. There's a lot of debate about that. Okay, very briefly, um, some of the things that are happening in molecular medicine at Michigan, I'll tell you very briefly about our M-Labs, Molecular Diagnostics Lab, the Michigan Center for Translational Pathology, and a little bit about a startup company that I have no financial interest in, I have no financial conflicts with anything I'm talking about, and then a, a, a new sequencing-based not-for-profit diagnostics company. So just M labs, we do molecular testing, uh, mostly for hematologic malignancies and not going through all the detail, but this is our growth, overall growth rate per month of molecular testing and it's now over 2,000 per month. So it's exploding. The molecular testing is absolutely exploding and what's driving this is it has predictive value, like what chemotherapy do you get? Do you get a bone marrow transplant or not? Um, it's profitable, it's growing, it's hard to keep up with the rate of growth. Another, and I think uh, actually Dr. Roberts is involved in this study as well as the MyOncoSeq project uh, in which patients with high stage cancer are being sequenced, their tumors and normal DNA are being sequenced um, in the uh, Michigan Center for Translational Pathology and, and this is complete genomic sequencing and all of the point mutations, translocations, gains and losses, all of these things are analyzed and then reviewed at interdisciplinary tumor boards. And then the patients actually get the results reported back to them. And just uh, in a typical patient, uh, it's a very complicated data analysis process that involves, you know, as I said, the rearrangements and gains and losses of chromosomes and all. But the average uh, patient has about 100 different mutations. So if you just take a cancer, typical solid tumor, there's at least 100 just point mutations. And then there are gains and losses and translocations. Making sense of this is uh, difficult, but um, th this is kind of a busy slide, but it's just the idea that almost every patient has molecular abnormalities like these P10 deletions and all that, um, that actually there's some drug out there that you could put the patients on. So um, that's been almost uniformly the case that when you analyze these patients, there's usually at least one actionable oncogene and a big part of the MyOncoSeq project is to figure out if you actually do all this fancy molecular testing and put these patients on these drugs, is there really any, any real benefit? Uh, 
this, this startup company, I'm trying to scroll through this very briefly. This is a company started up by um, a rural Chennaian and, uh, and uh, uh, Dan Rhodes. And it's a bioinformatics company. So it's an interesting kind of area where uh, uh, there's a lot of value to um, companies and all that analyze data, you know, in its various forms and all. There's a, a publicly available database called Oncomine that takes all the data that's out there on microarray expression data and all, and you, there's a, it, um, it's freely accessible. Um, there's a lot of work going on. So that's uh, a lot of work going on with taking a lot of different cell lines that have point mutations and figuring out which mutations are sensitive to which drugs. Uh, there, there are panels of markers you could do, and I imagine there's probably one for you know, dysplasia or something that you could do to think, well, how, how much of a risk is this to the patient? And then we're actually working together with our diagnostic lab to, um, to, to develop ways of analyzing this kind of high throughput sequencing data in a way that we can roll out more to the public. And uh, I think I'm just about at my last slide here. Um, just to uh, point out, uh, how these pieces relate to each other. We have the Center for Translational Pathology. We have M-Labs, which is our Molecular Outreach Diagnostics Lab. And, and then finally, um, we, we're, we're about to launch a not-for-profit uh, sequencing-based diagnostics company that will offer um, sequencing-based diagnostic tests for cancer initially for a fairly broad panel of targeted sequencing. So um, the era of personalized cancer therapy has arrived. I, I like this slide. It's the, uh, this is a textbook of equine medicine. And the, th oops, the uh, therapy for everything is, uh, oh, it's too late. Therapy for everything is shoot. <laughs> so uh, we're moving away from that. And uh, do we take questions now? Or, or, or? Um, so we have a time for a few questions uh, for Dr. Hess. Hi, Erica Scheller, uh, Oral Pathology, University of Michigan. I was just wondering, so the genomic sequencing is becoming just crazy and what you can do these days, but then there's this whole new field of epigenetics, and we know that pretty much every cancer has epigenetic changes. So how is that going to be incorporated, or how is it being incorporated in the personalized medicine these days? Yeah, so the, the questions relating to... Um, there are genetic changes and then there are epigenetic changes. And the beauty of the genetic changes is if you, if you detect a point mutation, it's like digital data for sure, it's, you know, it's, it's there or not. Um, I am sure that uh, things like DNA methylation will very likely become part of these panels in certain indications. Um, one of the problems we've had in general is that things that are more differences in levels rather than mutations if you look at the kind of tests we do, there are not many tests we do where we're just measuring high versus low and making a diagnostic decision. It's more like there's a translocation or point mutation. But I, as I said, I think DNA methylation is coming. Yeah. Other questions for Dr. Hess? Um, Jay, one of the things is going to change as well is the is education of health care providers. So in your view, are, are our healthcare providers today, whether it be physicians or dentists or pharmacists, actually have the toolbox they need right now so when this does happen, they're prepared for it? Or should we think differently? Should we rethink how we're educating our students? It's a, um, that's a great question. And I would say we're, we're, we're doing things, like for example, our pathology residents sit in on the interdisciplinary tumor boards and we're really, we're, we teach a fair amount of genetics in medical school. Like I think everybody should know, you know, how to what, what genes are and the proper terminology for genes, what translocations are. But I actually, um, I think one of the most important things that we're probably not teaching very well is we have to, as professionals, have to demonstrate that we're doing something that's valuable for patients. Uh, what I mean by that is whatever it is, like if we're doing molecular testing or 
or um, screening for diseases or something else that we have to become more fluent at explaining why this is a good thing for society to do. Why should we pay for this? Why are we the right people to be doing it? And I know we don't, at least when I went to medical school, we didn't think about it much, but I think increasingly we're gonna have to make the case, uh, always staying focused on what's best for the patient, but making the case that this is why it's important for us to do this. And sometimes we, there's some things we do that aren't so well supported. <laughs> so. Any other questions? Yes. Over here. Uh, Jay, so I'm really impressed with the increase in molecular diagnostics that you're doing here. And you also said that the payers are reluctant to cover this. So I have two questions. One, who's paying for your big increase? And, and what does it take to convince a payer to cover it? Yeah, well, we're getting paid for what we do. A lot of it's client build, but I would say that the kind of tests we offer in M labs are so well established as being useful that we haven't had a problem getting paid. I think the challenge comes each time a new marker comes along, there's this lag time before, you know, the you know, and that's a discussion with the payers that, yes, in fact, this is worth doing and all. So eventually, if it's a valuable test, it'll eventually be paid for, but it does, we have to budget time to lobby for payment, basically. So what are the, what are the triggers that tell them, yeah, it's, start, it's time to start paying for this test? I think um, when there's a very strong connection between the therapy and the molecular abnormality. So like if people who have this lesion will respond and the ones who don't, don't, they can figure it out pretty quickly that they may actually save money on that patient. Okay, thank you. Great. Other questions? Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Thank you.